your career, how long have you been involved with, uh, with tunnelling in particular? Well, um, I left university in 1956. I then spent two years flying in the RAF for national service. So I really started working for my living in 1958. 35 years or so I worked as a contractor and then at the end of the Channel Tunnel project I went out to run the Storbell Tunnel in Denmark and at that moment I became a consultant and an owner's man. You were on the Channel Tunnel? Yes, I went on to it in 1987 when tunneling was just about to start and I left in 92 which was two years before it was finally opened. I, uh, when I left, all the tunnelling had been done. I had two jobs in the tunnel. For the first half of my five years, I was the assistant construction director on the UK side, which meant that basically I looked after all the tunnelling and the, in the manufacture of the precast rings, which was a major operation, two and a half million tonnes of precast work. And then in the second half, I became operations director. This was for the contractor Transmortal Inc, TML as it became known and I looked after strategic planning and all the interfaces with the French. Um, you know, the, the sheer logistics of that project were quite amazing. At peak, we employed 14,000 people in the project. We were spending money at the rate of three million pounds a day. Um, we had 1,200 staff in our office alone. So it, it was quite difficult control. We did overspend. The project was fairly badly underpriced. My own opinion, and I think a lot would share the opinion, was that that was done for political purposes to get the project off the ground. There were 250 banks supplying us with the cash, in five lead banks, and over the first 18 months of the project, we were never quite sure. It was, the money was given in three tranches. We were never quite sure if we were going to get to the second tranche and the third tranche. We sighed a, a great sigh of relief when we knew we'd gone to the point of no return. One other point in the financing was um, the British government under Margaret Thatcher and the French government with uh, Mitterrand as president, they, would, they refused to give any financial guarantees and therefore we borrowed the money at an unbelievable 12% interest, which seems incredible in today's world. And once the job opened for traffic, of course, they couldn't generate, generate enough money to actually pay the interest. So eventually, um, interest was swapped for equity. So nowadays, the banks own the project. For, for 2012, a matter of interest, they turned over a billion on the project. They made a profit of 300 million. This is euros. And after they paid off interest, the profit came down to 34 million. Pretty pathetic, and against the turnover of, of a billion. It's often recognised that the Channel Tunnel was one of the first of the m mega projects of the new era, as it were. Uh, yeah. And um, its its entire setup was really quite complicated and flawed, one might say. Yes. Um, it was successful technically. Um, but, you know, we did, a, we did open at a year and a half after schedule. But the tunnelling, from our tunnellers' point of view, it was fractionally ahead of the original schedule. It was, it was pretty, that was pretty clever. The logistics was the secret, and the running of the interfaces, both internally and externally. And the way the interfaces worked, or the logistics, I should say, worked during construction was that we had a shaft, on the UK side this is, we had a shaft for all the people to go in and out of, in two high-speed lifts. We had a, a, an adit that had been built in the 1973 effort, which brought out all the muck on conveyors, the spoil from all these five TBMs working at the same time. And we had a second adit, which was a very big, wide adit, which had a rack and pinion railway for taking all the materials in. So that separated the three elements, people, materials, and spoil. And therefore, the, the, the tunneling went extremely well. In total, in four and a half, a million cubic metres of muck, eight, 8 million tonnes, which was spread over um, a very large site which had been formed uh, by constructing a, a one mile long seawall, 
300 meters out from the cliffs. It was interesting that it was uh, promoted and started and the approval was all spearheaded by the contractors. Oh, it was. Um, the first attempt at digging the Channel Tunnel was 1880 um, with the Beaumont tunneling machine worked by compressed there. The second attempt was seven, 1972 um, and we, we were able to uh, dig um, 200 meters of tunnel before the government at the time cancelled it. They didn't have enough money. But then from 1973 onwards, it was the contracting organisation that kept the whole thing alive and kept it in front of government. It carried on having plans and how it was going to be done and how it would be organised. And so when Margaret Thatcher started to get keen on, on it, there was a body in, in the construction industry who were able to tell her exactly how it could be done and that they were ready to do it and just go and talk to the French Prime Minister and help us get it started and she did. Bully for her. And then what did you think of the, of the whole creation of an owner? How did that go down well, at the time? I mean, what happened, we were all one at the time, it was the contracting organisation with the consultants that we had pulled in with us. Um, when the banks got involved it was five lead banks and 250 other banks who were creating the funding they said, hang on a minute, contractors are basically dishonest people. Very naughty of them. And we don't want to deal with a contracting organisation. We want a proper owner to deal with. So the company which got together to do the job, they had to split their forces and give some of them to Eurotunnel, who became the owner, and to Transmorch Link, who became the contractor. So. People, I wasn't there at the time, but people were sort of pushed in one direction or the other, not according to their own choice necessarily. Um, but the awful thing is, like many divorces, there was some very great bitterness between these two sides, who had all been one originally, and the claims on that project were pretty, pretty um, strenuous. And then, of course, they brought in Bechtel, a very tough man um, who, who, who did the negotiating uh, on the owner's side and they brought in Biak Lemley, who was a, an American as well. So you had Americans arguing with Americans on the, on the claims. So that was rather an extraordinary turnout. It was a pity. It was about after two years in the project, virtually everyone above me was pushed out. And there were about three layers above me. I just survived. And I, I think maybe this does happen on really mega, mega projects. You can't get it right at the beginning. We were overspending at the time, not because we were being rash with money or anything. The, the bid had not had enough money in it. Uh, and somebody's head had to roll. So that's what happened to a, a lot of people. I mean, some of the people who came in were very good. And the job was eventually extremely successful. They celebrated the 20 years mm -hmm. anniversary of mm -hmm. the whole through, I think it was in 2010. The, was the link the first link under the sea? Yes, scene? it was a little link between the French tunnel boring machine and the British tunnel boring machine. Uh, French miners and British miners drew lots to who was going to do the last digging. And at the appointed hour, these two men dug through. Uh, there were 50 of us on the UK side, 50 on the French side. All the UK guys went rushing through, picked up the French cigars and the French champagne, and we had the celebrating the, celebration on the French side because of course they had a different culture below ground. They could drink below ground, they could smoke below ground. If we did that in the UK, you were sacked instantly. It was a very different culture. I approve of that culture. I think it's safer. And then at the end of the Channel Tunnel project, I went out to run the Storbell Tunnel in Denmark. I went on after they'd had a terrible flood. Um, but the worst thing that happened um, during my time there was that one of our tunnel boring machines caught fire. Complete disaster, never moved again. It was initiated first by a, a burst hydraulic hose, but the light came from cigarette butts. So I'm passionate about having no smoking in tunnels. As a contractor, of course, you're involved in all the nitty gritty and the details and the equipment you're using and controlling your, your staff and your labor force and the union negotiations and things like that. Whereas an owner, you're stepping back a bit. And of course, I had to 
keep my mouth tight shut at times and not give too much advice, because if you give advice to a contractor, he expects you to pay, pay for the results. <laughs> <laughs> You're a civil engineer, trained as a civil engineer. Trained as a civil engineer, Loughborough University. Did four years there, um, loved every minute of it. What was the first tunnelling project that you were on? It was a 1958, it was a post office tunnel under the Barbican in London. Very interesting project. All the, all the tunnels were dug by hand. Most of the tunnels were seven foot diameter. They held 200 big cables in each tunnel, GPO, telephone cables. And then you spent some time on the Victoria Line? Yes, I was on the Victoria Line from 63 to 65. It was quite advanced. We still had hand shields, but we had better mechanized ways of bringing the muck out. The big advance was, at the beginning, there was um, quite a lot of cast iron segments being used, but there were a lot of experimental expanding concrete segments being used. And I think if you tried to pin it down, that was a time when the industry went very rapidly away from cast iron and onto concrete segments. Also, um, the client paid for two experimental tunnel boring machines. Um, one was the Canaan Moody drum digger, and, and the other one was the McAlpine um, tunneler. They were basically the start of soft ground um, tunnel boring machines in the UK um, for key, cohesive ground. It had to be a cohesive ground because, of course, the, the face was unsupported. But it was a time of huge transition. And then you came also then to? Los Angeles. I was project manager on a, the Hollywood extension of the Metro for the owner. Well, we were the construction manager working for the owner. My company, Hatchmont McDonald. It was in a bit of a mess when we took some of it over. They had been using the wrong sort of equipment. For instance, one of the tunnels had an old-fashioned shield with sand trays in it, which is kind of out of the art compared to today's work. Another tunnel had a primary lining in it, which was a sort of a badly made segments, which was all right. They weren't made to be brilliant. And then the, the key was wooden blocks, uh, which were meant to be hardwood, and they used softwood. So when the pressure came on, the tunnel lining shrank, and you got dilation of the ground above it, in one case a, a water main burst, and they had a few sinkholes in one of the best known streets in America, which wasn't good news. <laughs> But we came in on time at the end, and we came in under budget, which was pretty surprising in all the circumstances. But it was a very good job to work in. I retired originally from full-time work in 2001, so over the last 12 years I've been working independently, probably on about 19 jobs. I've enjoyed every minute. It's so lucky if you can enjoy your job. <laughs>